Hi everyone, I'm Alicia Kraus, and this week on the Washington Examiner Newsmaker Series, I am joined by former Trump State Department spokesperson Morgan Ortegas, and we discuss what's happening on the ground in Afghanistan, what this means for the United States on the world stage, and what you can do to help. Morgan, thank you so much for being here. I know that you've been on the phone a lot and trying to make things happen for those in Afghanistan that you've met during your service at the State Department and over the years. Can you tell us what you're hearing from your sources on the ground over there? Yeah, for the most part, Afghans are telling me about a pretty chaotic environment, one that's very um, tense. Uh, people are insecure. Uh, in any situation like these, there's the rumor, rumor mill going around about where the Taliban are, um, are they going house to house? And, and certainly people are dealing with that. You know, what's interesting to me is that most Afghans have told me sort of the pivotal moment when they felt um, it sort of decline into chaos was when it was confirmed that President Ghani left the country. And I think that was the moment whenever most people in Afghanistan, especially the people that were in, in the uh, Afghan national um, forces sort of threw up their hands and said, okay, you know, if he's given up, why, why would we continue to fight? And so I, I, I think when we look back at the history of what's gone on over these past few days and weeks, um, that moment will sort of be the moment. When, when he left, I think that's when it really, for Afghans on the ground, when it really fell apart. And what do you say to the critics here in the United States and even abroad that say, well, you know, the Afghan army just kind of gave up. They should have put up more of a fight. They were weak. They shouldn't have needed the United States support. So here's one of the issues is that we have trained the Afghan army to be dependent on American air support, right? We have been there with them for 20 years, as everyone talks about. We have trained them to fight the way we fight, right? And the way that we fight is with uh, American air support, right? That, that's what we do. And so we, uh, President Biden, decided to pull all of that air support. So the way in which we have trained them to fight, we, said, we suddenly told them, okay, well, you can't use any of the resources that we've given you to fight. So it's a little bit of an unfair advantage. And as I just said a second ago, whenever the president of the country flees, you know, if you were a member of the armed forces of, of your country and the president, you know, flees and the air support and everything you had gotten is, is gone, uh, how are you supposed to fight? I, I think it's really easy to, to criticize from, where, from the safety of our homes of where we all are. Obviously, the Afghan forces, uh, we think, should have been trained um, or, should, you know, should have been able to, should have been trained to be able to fight without us. And I think that's the key problem. It doesn't appear that we train them to be able to fight without our air support. Now with other countries like Russia, China, Pakistan, India, all rolling in to kind of fill this void that the United States has left, where do you think that this leaves us as a nation and Afghanistan's future when it comes to the international involvement and the impact that this might have on our future? That's a great, great question. And I think that's what um, everybody in my foreign policy world and my national security world, that's what we're all looking at. So there's a couple things that we know. Uh, the Chinese and Russians, for example, um, have left their embassy open in Afghanistan. They've not closed their embassy. So you're seeing uh, the Americans, the Canadians, the Brits, the, German, the Germans, uh, everyone who was there from the NATO mission are closing embassies and are fleeing and are getting out of Afghanistan, right? The West. And who's staying? The Chinese, Russians, Iranians. Um, and we know that these, these people uh, already have, or at least countries, China, Russia, Iran, for example, Pakistan, obviously, uh, have a relationship uh, with the Taliban. And they really have no scruples about a Taliban-led government or what that means, because they don't care about what the Taliban uh, is doing to people. I mean, China is committing a genocide right now against Uyghur Muslims in their own country. So I don't think they really give a flip about what the Taliban is going to do. So, you know, t the Afghanistan and China actually share a tiny border. It's, it's not big, but they are neighboring countries. And so when you look, when you sort of peel back and look at Central Asia and, and Southeast Asia, um, when we look at how we are, have been trying to um, uh, ally with these countries and get them to sort of a part of our coalition against the Chinese Communist Party, that's going to be hard to do whenever we have um, just completely withdrawn everything from Afghanistan. And I'm not just talking about military here. I'm talking about our embassy presence as well. We have no presence in Afghanistan, not even a diplomatic presence now. So given the fact that we don't even have a diplomatic presence there, and of course the president said this week that he will be sending in troops to try to help evacuate those people who have helped us, 
I mean, is this situation too complicated to solve or is there light at the end of the tunnel? Oh, that's a big question. Uh, listen, as it comes to the immediate security on the ground, uh, we know that, as you pointed out, uh, thousands of American troops are being sent in to secure the airport. It appears that um, that commercial flights uh, have resumed. Um, this is not, you know, these are mostly countries that are, are sending in planes to get people out. Um, so it's not necessarily like Delta's now flying in there. Um, so, it's, so it's more sponsored charter type flights that, that are taking place. Um, and, and for all conditions so far look as if uh, the American forces um, do have control uh, of the airport, but you know, the Taliban are there as well. So it's a really delicate, weird situation where I'm sure our forces on the ground, including our diplomats that are still on the ground, um, are still having to work with the Taliban to get people uh, from the airport, uh, excuse me, from their homes to the airport on planes because there's these Taliban checkpoints uh, on the way to the airport. And by the way, it's not like the Taliban has some like fantastic, you know, command and control of their, you know, operation. You never knew, know what some of these lone, rogue, ignorant fighters are doing um, to innocent Afghans. Um, and, and keep in mind, Josh Rogan from The Washington Post has pointed this out. Um, and, and I believe the Department of Defense confirmed, confirmed as well that we probably have uh, maybe 10,000 Americans, dual citizens, but still Americans uh, in Afghanistan that we have to get out. So uh, the humanitarian situation um, is not uh, going to be solved anytime soon. We're probably still weeks away from that. So that leads me to my next question. I think I was stunned when I uh, saw the reports this week about a major news corporations in the United States begging the White House to help get over 200 journalists mm -hmm. off the ground at the Kabul airport. You just mentioned the 10,000 fellow American citizens that we have there, in addition to the people that helped us, you know, the interpreters, the informants over the last two decades. Mm -hmm. Where did this fail? Like who in the chain of command is responsible for not planning ahead of time or potentially foreseeing this issue and getting our people out of there before this all took place? Yeah, I, I mean, ultimately the failure is always with the president and his NSC because uh, they are ultimately the ones in charge. The Department of Defense is leaking and saying, hey, we tried to warn them, we put up plans, we weren't giving authority until the last minute. Uh, this is like a super bureaucratic point, but I know in the Obama administration um, and a lot of the political appointees for President Biden are Obama holdovers, same same crowd of people. Uh, one of the criticisms often from uh, the DOD and, and other agencies is that everything was micromanaged um, from the state, uh, excuse me, from the White House, from the NSC. So it doesn't surprise me at all if the NSC dilly dallied and waited until the last minute to give the authority. You also have, listen, you have a really big problem uh, at the State Department. You have Tony Blinken, the Secretary of State, said, I think it was either in an interview or in congressional testimony, he said, well, you're not gonna see uh, Afghanistan fall from a Friday to a Monday. That's what literally happened. <laughs> it literally fell from Friday. They gave a briefing on Thursday at the State Department saying that um, that it was not a full evacuation, that we were keeping a diplomatic presence. Um, and by Saturday uh, of last week, everybody was out. Um, of the embassy and um, and we abandoned the embassy and had to destroy classified documents. So one of the reasons why I think, um, and this is just me guessing here, but knowing the State Department where I was employed just a few months ago, uh, probably one of the reasons why they had no plan in place um, to process all of these interpreters, um, we call them CIVs, right? It's an acronym for the, for the visa that people are trying to get. Uh, one of the reasons for all the people that helped us, we didn't have a plan to get them out, um, is because I, I don't think they actually planned for a scenario mm -hmm. where Ghani would flee and that Afghanistan would just fall seemingly overnight to the Taliban. So because uh, they didn't um, foresee that scenario, they didn't plan for it. And, and that's really an error um, it, it, from the top of the State Department on down. You know, you plan for all the scenarios, even the un most unlikely ones. Mm -hmm. um, and so the State Department, the DHS, they have a lot to answer for why were no plans put in place. And now we have a problem uh, that we have to pay careful attention to. And so obviously they're in the middle of a, of a quagmire humanitarian situation. So they're trying to feverishly process all these things. Well, we have to make sure that we're also properly vetting at the same time. 
uh, for who's coming in. Now, the DOD is pretty stringent about uh, the paperwork in terms of um, who is an interpreter, what do they have to have. But, you know, we also have to, while there is a humanitarian situation, we do have to be careful uh, at who, we're, at who we're vetting and making sure that we actually are bringing over the people who helped us. Because I'm sure anyone and everyone wants to get out of Afghanistan right now. I certainly would. I don't, I, I understand that sentiment. Uh, I do want to talk to you about what this looks like for America's future with our allies. Um, General Petraeus touched on that earlier this week. But first, I want to ask you for your immediate response when you hear people like the Secretary of State, uh, President Biden, Jen Psaki, and others saying things like, well, the Taliban has to decide where they want to sit amongst the community of nations. Um, my friend Ben Shapiro kind of laughs at this and says, you know, they don't care about sipping Manhattans in Georgetown. They, they care about ruling under the law that dominated in the 8th century that puts women and children, you know, back in burqas with, with no education. I could go on and on and on. What is your response to the Biden administration's line of seemingly wanting to sit at the table with the Taliban now? So it, it's funny. Um, one of the some of the Taliban representatives have been doing cable news interviews and and have been giving press conferences and things that we certainly didn't see 20 years ago. Um, and, and I'm paraphrasing here. This isn't verbatim, but one of the reporters um, asked, uh, you know, what about women's rights? And um, and essentially the Taliban representative said, well, as long as women follow Sharia law, they will have rights. So. That doesn't that doesn't make me um, extremely uh, hopeful about the situation. I mean, I mean, listen. The bottom line is there was no military solution uh, in Afghanistan. We knew that we've been trying it for 20 years. Um, but what we were trying to do in the Trump administration, what Mike Pompeo was trying to do, was to get the Taliban, the government of Afghanistan, so that was President Ghani who just fled, women, human rights activists, trying to get everybody at the table to negotiate. Uh, what the future of Afghanistan would look like. And, and, and we did want the Taliban to be a part of that discussion because they are a presence there. Uh, we, we tried to uh, kill them all and we didn't, right? They, they existed dis despite uh, some, some very good uh, military people who, uh, like General Miller, for example, who had who's been in charge for almost the past two years in Afghanistan. So it, it is important, um, I think, for me to clarify that, uh, you know, under Mike Pompeo and in the Trump administration, we were trying to find uh, a solution where all Afghans could come to the table to decide the future of the country. Uh, but here's the here's, I think, the, the big differentiator between what the Trump administration was trying to do and what the Biden administration has failed to do. And that is negotiating from a position of strength. Uh, you'll remember, I think it was President Trump's first year in office uh, that he released what we you know, nicknamed the Moab, the mother of all bombs uh, in Afghanistan. Um, and, and so between doing that and he really unleashed General Miller whenever he first started, uh, whenever he first took over command in Afghanistan to really go after the Taliban, uh, we famously took out Qasem Soleimani. So we had a lot of um, points uh, points throughout uh, President Trump's tenure to point to to say, we're tough, we're serious, we will negotiate, uh, but we'll also cut your head off if we need to, right? Mm -hmm. Ask Iran. And I, I think that's what this administration, the current one, President Biden, what the team doesn't understand is the difference between President Trump's team negotiating with the Taliban and President Biden's team negotiating with the Taliban is doing it from a position of strength. And that's why you see the same team back in power that negotiated the JCPOA with Iran, right? So why are they saying, oh, the Taliban really needs to do X, Y, Z if they want to be respected in the international community? That sounds friv frivolous to you and me, uh, but why is this team saying this? Well, remember, this is the same team that negotiated with Iran on their nuclear program and genuinely believed if we gave them billions of dollars in sanctions relief and flew pallets of cash to them, that they would take that money, that they would suddenly build a better life for the Iranian people, um, and that they would stop being the world's largest state sponsor of terrorism. They really thought that they would moderate their behavior, that European and Western companies would come in, and that we would usher in this you know, new era for Iran. Well, what they forgot is that they were negotiating with terrorists. Right. They're the world's leading state sponsor of terrorism. So what did they do with that money? They used that money uh, to enhance their ballistic missile programs and, and other military hardware. Uh, they used that money to fund all of their Shia uh, terror groups around the Middle East um, and, and to really almost set those groups on fire. So why is that applicable to the situation in Afghanistan? Because it's that same sort of naive, naivete 
uh, that this group uh, took when negotiating with Iran that they take uh, to negotiating with the Taliban, which mm -hmm. is, well, if you really want to be liked and invited to our cocktail parties in Paris, you really need to do X, Y, Z. Um, and unfortunately, uh, they are learning the hard way that the, you know, the, the Islamic fascists in charge of Iran and now the new Islamic fascists in charge of Afghanistan uh, don't really give, you know, a crap about their French 75. So I want to ask my favorite cocktail. <laughs> well, one of these days we'll have to have one together. Hopefully, when the world kind of yeah. sorts itself out, I do want to yeah. ask you. Uh, speaking of the world stage, General Petraeus said that this fall of Afghanistan is an embarrassment and bad for the reputation of the United States, specifically when it comes to our allies. Would you agree with him? Totally. I mean, General Petraeus is someone that I know very well uh, and respect. Um, and, and listen, I am not, again, I, I'm not in the uh, forever war crowd that we had to keep 20,000 troops in Afghanistan. I'm not a part of that crowd, right? I, I, I worked for Mike Pompeo, uh, wanted to get us down to uh, the 20, what President Biden inherited was 2,500 troops, a residual force where we can focus on counterterrorism. And so to your question, you know, I don't think that there's, there's nothing really good that can come out of this that I can think of. Save that if we, if this administration um, is serious about countering the Chinese Communist Party, uh, they are going to have to learn from this international uh, embarrassment and this international failure. I've always, listen, I've always said um, I, I'm an American before I am a partisan. And I think that the threat of the Chinese Communist Party and how they want to dominate the world is too big for one political party. So I will always push and be an advocate when um, Biden and the Democrats are, are doing the right thing on China. So I hope um, it's terrible what happened. I hope this is a wake up call for them, um, that they are not going to win the bigger, greater, great power competition uh, between us and the co Chinese Communist Party uh, by talking about platitudes about, you know, goodwill and international gestures. All right, Morgan, last question for you, and I so appreciate your very valuable time today. For the Washington Examiner audience, they're very generous in giving people, and I think a lot of people look at the horrific photos and images and seeing the stories and notes from people uh, in Afghanistan right now are just wondering what can they do? What can we practically do to help? That's a very, very good question. So um, there's an organization that I'm promoting that seems to be the most effective so far. You guys can just Google it. Um, it's called No One Left Behind. No One Left Behind. So um, go to their website. You can, you can donate to them. If you have people that you know you're trying to get out, um, you can give them their information. Also, I would like to give a shout out to Senator Tom Cotton's office. Uh, his staff has been working night and day to try um, and, and help the State Department to get things uh, processed, um, to get the right people out, not just everyone, but the right people. Um, so Senator Tom Cotton's office is also an ex excellent way to go. I believe the email there is evac, so that's evac at um, cotton.senate.gov. All right, thank you so much for your time, and I hope to have you back in the future. Thanks so much, I appreciate it.